for joining uh, this program by the Environmental Justice Committee of the ABA section on Civil Rights and Social Justice. I'm Rob Weiner. I'm chair of the section. Before we start, I'd like to give the NPR like plug here. Uh, if you like programming like this, mm -hmm. if you think that the organization representing American lawyers ought to have a portion of its uh, organization that focuses on civil rights and social justice. And if you are not a member of our section, please join. And if you are a member, we could always use the donation. Now, Senator Booker is uh, right now doing what senators do. He is voting, and he will be here in a few minutes. So I'd like to introduce our moderator uh, and get the panel started in the interim. The moderator is Randy Heyman. He is a partner at Beverage and Diamond, and he is the former head of DC Water. And you will be in his capable hands uh, for, uh, until the senator gets here and then uh, after he's done. Hey, Randy. Thank you very much. I have to admit that I am excited to be here this evening. Environmental justice is one of the most important issues facing the country. It is an issue that is growing in importance and in acceptance, and people are learning about it. And you can tell that by the numbers we have. The room is almost full, for those of you on the webcam. And then on the web, on the web we have over uh, 200 individuals who are attending and watching this event tonight. So you're among a lot of other people who have the same interest you have in learning about environmental justice and understanding its importance understanding how it's going to affect our lives going forward. Now, the senator will be with us shortly, and I'm excited to hear, too, about his, um, his bill, Environmental Justice Act of 2017. But before we get to that part, we have two other gentlemen who are exceptional lawyers, well uh, knowledgeable of environmental law and experienced environmental justice. We have Patrice Sims and Mustafa Ali. Join me in saying a warm hello to you. What we'll do at this point, gentlemen, is I'll give you both about five minutes or so and give you a chance to introduce yourself with the understanding that we have some law students who are in the, in the group possibly who may want to hear about how you got to where you are and what your titles are and what you, what you do, but also, too, uh, just to kind of give us a thought, a little flavor of environmental justice, why is it important to you, where, where do you see things going? So with that, why don't we start first with Mustafa? Okay, I was going to let senior counsel go. No. <laughs> uh, well, it's good to be here with everyone. Glad to see so many folks who are not only interested, but also engaged around helping our most vulnerable communities. I was extremely blessed um, that I actually had the opportunity to as a student um, and to grow up in the environmental justice movement. And partially the reason that I'm here is because communities had faith in me. Um, and knowing that I would be authentic in the work that I was going to do. But the other part of that sort of, the other side of the coin, is that there were individuals uh, who also saw a young man who needed to, to get focused and, and actually took time. One of those folks was in the room, Danny Gogol, uh, who was uh, actually there in the beginning when we founded the Office of Environmental Equity. The other one was Dr. Clarice Gaylord. If you're really going to understand environmental justice, then you have to look through the lens of community. There is something that we've said for years and years in the environmental justice movement that communities speak for themselves. If you also want to understand the successes that have happened in relationship to environmental justice, then you have to go back to the uh, principles of environmental justice, which came out of the first people of color summit in 1991. And then you also, when you look at the Environmental Protection Agency, when you look at the other 17 agencies that have this responsibility also for environmental justice, then you have to ask the question, where did the information, where did the ideas, 
where did those recommendations come from that have helped them to be successful in the spaces and places that they have? And that actually came out of Michigan Working Group in the late 80s and the early 90s. Those sets of recommendations guided uh, much of our early work um, at the agency, and then that expanded um, outside the agency to a number of other departments uh, and agencies. So when you look at things like the Environmental Justice Small Grants Program, uh, which when I left had provided about 25, 24, 25 million dollars to communities, over 1,500 communities, that came out of a set of recommendations uh, and working with stakeholders around the country to develop that. When you look at the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, a FACA, also out of a set of recommendations, the Office of Environmental Equity, which became the Office of Environmental Justice, also out of a set of recommendations. And the difference with the Office of Environmental Equity, which was different than a number of other offices at that time, was that it actually was a place and a space where people actually listened and wanted to give an intersection point to our most vulnerable communities so that they could have an opportunity to navigate the bureaucracy that we call Washington, the bureaucracy that is in our federal agencies and departments, um, and, and help them to be able to get traction uh, on some of our most important issues. The other thing was it helped to give them an opportunity to validate what was happening in their communities. I remember one of the first meetings that I went to, I was walking down the hallway of Waterside Mall. Uh, that's where the Environmental Protection Agency used to be. And I remember there were two gentlemen who were walking in front of me at that time. Um, and they shared, these were middle managers at the agency, and they shared uh, the, among themselves, I don't know why we're going to this meeting, because the things that people are saying couldn't possibly be happening in our country. And that was the work that we had to do in helping to educate and not just convince, but move the culture inside the agency uh, to understand that there was real issues that were happening. And that happened by actually bringing folks in, allowing their voice to be a guide in that process, if you will. Now, I often think that it's interesting that when we look back in history, we see some similarities that are happening today. We have an administration who's doing everything that they can to prove that climate change is not real, not that much different than in the early 90s when we were trying to help people to understand that environmental justice was real. So you see the cyclical process that goes on of trying to sort of dismantle and deconstruct uh, the work that's happened. And then, if you can do that, then have the validation that these issues don't need to be uh, resourced. They don't need to be the attention placed upon them. Uh, so it's an interesting time that we are now living in. And I was super blessed uh, to be able to grow up as a very, very young person and to listen and to learn uh, and then to hopefully be authentic in the work that I've done um, in now hundreds and hundreds of communities across the country. Excellent. If you would have been, your current title is? Oh, uh, I'm Mustafa Santiago Ali. I am the Senior Vice President for Climate, Environmental Justice, and Community Revitalization at the Hip Hop Caucus, and I was blessed for a number of years to work uh, at the Environmental Protection Agency. Yes. If you would, please. Very inspiring. He's doing all the friend. So I, I'm Patrice Sim. And um, I am currently the Vice President for Litigation in the D.C. office at Earth Justice. Um, for those of you who don't know what Earth Justice is, it is the country's uh, largest and oldest litigating nonprofit environmental law firm. Um, we represent uh, organizations, big and small, communities, uh, tribes, um, uh, and um, and others related to environment, environmental justice, and uh, climate, and a whole array of issues. Um, and we are primarily a law firm. That's what we do. Um, I want to uh, provide a little bit of my trajectory as well. Um, Mustafa was describing how um, he came from the environmental justice movement and came to do this work and to do this work on, on a national level and to do it in such a powerful and important way. Um, and I came to this work very, very differently. Uh, I came to this work from the role of being a traditional environmental lawyer. Um, and I am 
I did not emerge from the environmental justice movement. I came to respect that movement and respect the people who give life to the environmental movement uh, in tremendous ways, but I came from a more traditional legal path. Uh, I started practicing as a lawyer in the mid-90s, late 90s, in, at EPA, and their Office of General Counsel, in the Air and Radiation Law Office, at Waterside Mall, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um, spent a good number of years really immersed in the practice of environmental law as it then existed. Um, and one of the things that ultimately I came to understand was that there was something fundamentally missing in the way that we approached environmental protection and environmental law in this country. Um, there were voices that were not there. There were people who were not at the table. And as it turned out, these were people who were very often those who were, in fact, most affected by the decisions that the agency was making and the other agencies that dealt with environmental issues. And I came to realize this as a traditional practitioner of environmental laws, and it troubled me. Um, and so I began to explore, well, what is this about? What is the, what is the origin of this? Right. Um, and one of the things I discovered is um, it doesn't take a lot of work to look back at the history of the emergence of environmental laws and environmental protection uh, and realize that they were uh, and continued to be at that point um, informed by uh, informed by voices, informed by issues, and informed by concerns that did not necessarily reflect and did not incorporate the concerns that were felt by the communities that were, that were often at the epicenter of where the greatest uh, environmental problems uh, resided. Um, so I began to, in my professional career, explore how we could change the way that we were doing this work. So I ultimately left uh, EPA in, uh, in about 2005 uh, after having spent about seven and a half years, almost eight years there between the Austin General Council and the Environmental Appeals Board. Um, and I joined NRDC as a senior attorney working on uh, energy, but also public health. And this was my opportunity to really sink my teeth into this issue of environmental justice. I joined NRDC, in fact, about two weeks after the hurricanes, Hurricane Katrina and Rita hit the Gulf Coast, uh, and found myself working in pretty short order in New Orleans, in Mississippi, um, directly with communities, directly with the most affected communities, and it really fundamentally changed my view of what it meant to be an environmental lawyer, what it meant to be an environmental uh, activist to be someone who cares about what happens in our environment and how we protect uh, public health. And of course, I met some uh, people who profoundly affected uh, my life, including my good friend and Mustafa as well, Leslie Field, um, and, and who has since become one of my closest friends in the world. And she taught me a lot about uh, environmental justice and what it meant to do this work and how someone like myself who did not grow from that movement but who had a really deep understanding about how our environmental laws worked and how government worked could make a real difference uh, in the lives uh, of, of people who are most affected. And, and by internalizing a commitment to the principles that motivate uh, environmental justice, principles like communities speaking for themselves, communities, voices, being brought into the decision-making process in an authentic way, changing the way we approach our laws, approach our policy-making, so that we hear those voices and that those voices are given a meaningful platform. And not only that they're heard, but also that we as policy-makers, whether we're inside the government or outside the government, and I will say there are a lot of policies that are affected by people in that are not in the government, whether it's private organizations, 
nonprofits, be they environmental nonprofits, or even organizations like this. Um, uh, and I realized that this was something of a calling, uh, and uh, I was going to ensure that as I continued to practice, I made environmental justice a centerpiece of how I approached the work that I do. With that, we'll stop for a moment. The center is here, so I'll hand it back over to Robert. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I have the great good fortune of introducing Senator Booker. I was lucky enough to start my career as a law clerk for Justice Thurgood Marshall. And one of the great qualities, the most admirable qualities that Justice Marshall had was his willingness to risk all for his principles. Uh, to endure personal hardship to do the right thing. And I think Senator Booker exhibits some of those same qualities. As a council member and then mayor of Newark, he lived in a tent, in a mobile home, and for eight years in public housing. He voluntarily cut his own pay. He took on powerful and even dangerous interests, and at one point, reportedly, there was a plot on his life. Now, in the U.S. Senate, Senator uh, Booker has resisted uh, the bitter surge of partisanship, and he's offered to meet with his Republican counterparts. He's even started having dinner at one point with Ted Cruz. Um, but he was willing at the same time to buck Senate tradition and testify against Senator Sessions' nomination for Attorney General for very good and compelling reasons. He has spurned political orthodoxy, which has earned an attack from both the left and the right, which is a pretty good sign that you're in the right place. His resume. You know, you couldn't make this up. Stanford, um, where he was um, all Pac-10 academic team in football, uh, president of the senior class, uh, ran the peer counseling service. From there, he was a Rhodes Scholar, then to Yale Law School, then a town lawyer to the city council, mayor, and then senator. And when he was mayor, this, this guy even ran into a burning building to save one of his neighbors uh, suffering burns and smoke inhalation itself. But this, is, uh, uh, this is an American hero. And, and he will talk tonight on the Environmental Justice Act, which he introduced. But rather than try to describe it, everybody here probably knows more about it than I do. Certainly Senator Booker does, so I'll let him address it. I just want to note one quotation that Senator Booker that caught my eye. Um, as I was uh, looking at his biography, he said, small acts of decency ripple in ways I think his record indicates that he has practiced uh, that principle and has lived that principle for his career. We're very lucky to have you here. Thank you, Senator Booker. Not what you all know that he, he was uh, part of the hip hop caucus, and the entire time he's smirking, looking at my introduction, and all he's thinking is a great lyric by Public Enemy, "Don't believe the hype." <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I am uh, thrilled to be here. That was an overly generous introduction. Uh, the reality is, we're all in this uh, together. We're all uh, fighting in the same trench. We should not take each other too seriously. We should take the mission seriously. We should take the people we serve seriously. Uh, but we should never allow uh, our, our egos uh, to grow uh, bigger than the mission uh, and, and, and the humility of a lot of the people that are, are struggling in this country uh, for the basic rights um, uh, that we, uh, you know, every day when we pledge the flag, we make this assertion that just is not true. We're not a country of liberty and justice for all. Uh, those are aspirational ideals, uh, and we are all in the fight. 
And I, I stand here um, uh, very, I, first of all, I, I, just like myself, I had parents that would always check me. My father would be like, you know, boy, you got more degrees in the month of July, but you ain't hot. Uh, uh, you know, you're going to like, prove worthy of all these blessings that you've got and do something in service of other people. And my parents humbled me by making me understand that, um, that I was where I was because of this incredible effort and tradition, history of this country of activism, of ordinary Americans who made extraordinary commitment uh, to the cause of our country. And they were very uh, grateful for the grassroots folks who they felt a kinship with uh, that were still active in places like Newark and Patterson, to say, I was in Camden uh, on Monday, uh, just seeing good folk who are still looking at hands on the plow, have other options in life that are just not leading the fight. So my parents also were very uh, great in pointing out the power of certain professions, and one of them is the reason why I'm so happy to be here right now, which is the, the, the power of lawyers, of everyday lawyers uh, to use their education and their training uh, to do good work. Uh, I'm here right now because when my parents were facing, most people don't know New Jersey is like the fifth most segregated state in America. Um, there's a legacy of overt discriminatory laws stemming from Washington, D.C. Uh, to the state of New Jersey. And even when those laws stopped, uh, there were still practices of discrimination uh, that kept our state segregated. And my family, when they moved from Washington, D.C. Uh, to New Jersey, found incredible real estate stealing. And it wasn't until uh, the Fair Housing Council connected with my parents uh, and they got a group of lawyers to start a sting operation where they would be sent to look at a home, and when they were told it was sold, um, a white couple would come posing as home buyers right after them and find out the house was still for sale. And on the day uh, uh, my parents found this house they loved, they were told it was sold, a white couple came still for sale, they put a bid on the house, and the bid was accepted, the white couple's bid was accepted, the papers were drawn up, and on the day of the closing, the white couple didn't show up, my dad did, and a volunteer lawyer, um, to call in a guy was named Marty Friedman, and they marched in to confront the real estate agent, and Marty stood in front of them, started this incredible civil rights speech. My father said they didn't even get into it uh, because the real estate agent was so angry that he'd been caught, and he stands up and punches my dad's lawyer uh, in the face, punches Marty in the face, and sticks a dog on my dad. Uh, and every time my dad would tell the story, trust me, the dog would get bigger. Um, <laughs> Eventually, as a little kid growing up, it'd be like, oh, I want a pack of wolves to get you into the house. <laughs> um, but but the, the heroism of everyday lawyers to change destiny um, is, is pretty incredible. And so for me, my life has been about trying to uh, uh, prove worthy of uh, the struggle. Um, because my parents never let me think that somehow, you know, uh, I made it because of myself. They knew two things. One, my, my parents, my dad again, would always check me and just say, boy, you know, 18 years old, I had more teenage swagger than anybody had in this room when you were teenagers. I thought I was something special. I'd be walking around my house and my father would say, boy, don't you dare walk around here like you did a triple. Uh, you were born on third base. Uh, they wanted me to know that I stood on the shoulders uh, of folks who had fought and struggled, sacrificed, and even died for me. But they also wanted me to know that the America I was experiencing just wasn't the reality, and that my, my sense of justice was tied up uh, in, in, in the, the justice that we experienced by other folks, and they weren't experiencing justice, and my, the life I was living was a lie and in danger. And so, I, you know, I got started right away. And I want you to know, I didn't become an environmentalist because I was worried about global warming. I, I didn't become an environmentalist because I was concerned about penguins or polar bears. I became an environmentalist because I was living in Newark. I came there because I was an activist and believed in confronting issues of poverty and disadvantage and was running around with some incredible leaders. I always say I got my BA from Stanford with my PhD on the streets of Newark and from some amazing tenant activists. But when I start seeing things that were unconscionable to me, so offensive to me, right in my own community that dealt with the environment, I realized that the real environmental issues of this country, that the, the most Pressing urgent need were issues of environmental racism uh, and, and issues of environmental injustice. And what I mean by that is when you live in communities where the lead paint poisoning rates are epidemic, epidemic, 
Here were families struggling, believing the American dream, working hard, but their children were being addled by lead. Here I was in, in, a, in a community where the asthma rates were three and four times higher, where things were plowed into this urban community of Newark, New Jersey, that other folks didn't want in their neighborhood. More privileged communities didn't want the incinerator. They didn't want the sewage treatment facility. And, and, and then when I see that, that, that I live in Newark around two Superfund sites, and now we have longitudinal data that show that children born within a mile or so of a Superfund site have 20% higher rates of, of, of birth defects, 20% higher rates of autism. When I started seeing kids in my community, emergency rooms for asthma, addled by lead. When I started seeing children in my community trying to do what I did as a child with my grandfather who went to uh, HBCU in Arkansas and, and, and learned about agriculture and took me in my backyard, planted tomatoes, planted zucchini, showed me how vegetables go. And then I go to do the same thing in Newark by creating urban farming, trying to deal with our food desert. And the state um, agricultural organization, uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, comes in and tells me, you can't plant in the soil. And I'm like, what do you mean? I, I, I've got this vision. I'm going to turn this block. Uh, Adam Zipkin is in the back right there was the leader of my economic development team. He's running this project for me when I was mayor. Like, you can't plant in the soil because the soil is toxic. And we have to do the whole project in planter boxes. What happens to uh, humanity? What happens to human dignity when you're separated from your air, when you're separated from your water, when you're separated from your soil, when literally you are growing up in a toxic environment? that is saddling you with diseases and conditions, and then you are expected to deal with poverty on top of that, working full-time jobs and still having to live in public housing. Then you are on top of that schools that aren't serving your genius. Then on top of that, you're with a criminal justice system that is not fair. It's targeting poor people and minorities. Then on top of that, you deal with rates of violence where you have trauma and and and. and and shrines to dead children all over your city, street corner vigils and candles? How is that equality? How is that justice for all? And, and something I'm learning now that I'm a senator representing an entire state, a part of a federal body, is that as, as much as I had nights where I, I would come home so angry I would just sit on the couch and I would curl up with my two best friends, Ben and Jerry, and 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 and, and, and turn on, you know, Stuart and Colbert, hoping that they would make me laugh at something. You feel so isolated, and angry, but the reality is, is that's another delusion. We in this country have so much common pain, but we don't have a, 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 a common purpose. We, we, we have a common pain that we're lacking a common purpose. The issues facing Newark are not an anomaly. We know this. People want to talk about Flint as if Flint, Michigan is an anomaly. Well, Reuters did that report. 3,000 communities with twice the blood lead levels, the kids have twice the blood lead levels in Flint. Tom and I have been friends now for some time, but we, we took a trip. I went through the black belt in the south. And, and, and I sat in rural Alabama in, in, in churches full of black folks who were experiencing things that made me feel this connection from urban Newark with what they were enjoying. Tallahassee, Georgia, uh, excuse me, Tallahassee, Alabama, Uniontown, Alabama, where a, a level of corporate villainy in this country. I, it just like sin, like I had never seen it, where the corporations running these massive landfills would never do that to their own community. And folks in churches telling me that they, they, they can't put their clothes on lines anymore because their clothes will leak with a stench when they bring them in, that they told them not to eat the fruit from the trees on their land anymore because it's poison, where they can't keep their windows open anymore, when the only wealth they had passed down for generations going back the reconstruction has been stolen from them by these corporations where they can't now sell their land because it's become, rendered worthless. 
And this is all bad, but what's the worst is what it's doing to their bodies. Again, the assault to bodies. To stand in meeting houses and hear stories about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment and have people tell me that it's happening all over again, this time not injecting individual bodies, but injecting entire communities with toxicity. I, I went to Duplin County, North Carolina. And I could not believe that this is my country, where I watch farming have been destroyed by these massive agribusinesses that have destroyed small farmers in this country, rendered them near to, to near sharecropping. These poor pig farmers now that have entered into these ungodly contracts with these massive international conglomerates, Smithfield, the largest one, a Chinese-owned company seeing these massive, massive capos, concentrated animal feeding operations, covered because, God forbid, Americans see what's going on inside. But the pigs who produce 10 times the feces in an individual, millions of pigs, 9 million pigs in North Carolina, 9 million people in New Jersey, but we have waste treatment plants. I told you about one in Newark. But there's no waste treatment facility. They have nowhere to put the excrement flowing through the grate into these massive lagoons. And then they spray this excrement on spray fields. And I stood there on the side of the road watching the spray. Some of it settles, but if anybody's run a sprinkler in their home, a lot of it mists off of the property. And where are these communities? Are these wealthy communities? Are these privileged communities that these capos have moved into? No. They're poor communities. They're black communities. And now what do we have in those communities? I sat with the activists. Respiratory diseases, cancer, can't open your windows, can't run your air conditioning, can't put your laundry outside. The value of your land stolen and your body again. Your health stolen from you by a level of corporate villainy that is outrageous. It is unacceptable that nobody would tolerate anywhere in this country, and it's foisted upon vulnerable communities. Cancer Alley, how could you have a place in this country where you just say Cancer Alley and people know what you're talking about? Oh, this is Louisiana. This is the stretch of the Mississippi between Baton Rouge and between New Orleans. Again, going to historic black communities where they trace the history on that land back to slavery. Sitting in churches where people are crowding in, not to see me, but they're just so happy that a federal official, any federal official, will come down and listen to the hell in which they're living. I was handed the data when I got there. The data that shows that they're pushing out pollutants into the air well above the EPA regulated standards. And person after person in that church stands up and talks about their family members who have died of cancer in Cancer Alley and how they can't sell their land. This is the United States of America, coast to coast, north to south, community or facing levels of environmental injustice that is so unacceptable, and levels of disease that don't belong in a nation this wealthy and this rich, as corporations are outsourcing all of their pain and their costs on the communities and internalizing their profit and getting wealthier and wealthier based off of the suffering of communities. I sat with Peter Hopat, a a, a, a specialist doctor that treats neglected tropical diseases. To talk to him, I'm, on the sub, I'm a ranking member of the subcommittee on Africa. And I'm concerned about tropical diseases in Africa. And he sits down with me and starts talking to me about these diseases. And then he says, by the way, there are millions of Americans suffering them. And you don't, there are doctors who don't even think they exist on our continent anymore. And so I called up one of the activists in, in Lowndes County, Alabama. Catherine Flores went down to visit with her. 
I could not believe what I saw. Raw sewage running through people's backyards, poor folks, minority folks, getting worms and intestinal diseases that their doctors don't even know to test for because they think it should not exist in this country. Like you said, there's a dream in this land with his back against the wall. To save the dream for one, he must save the dream for all. And so we're all in this together. This is a fight from the grassroots to the Capitol building. It is no less urgent than the fight for civil rights. It is no less urgent than the fight for housing rights. It is no less urgent than the fight for voting rights. In fact, everything I named right there, if you take away a person's health, What's the sense of having civil rights if you've got cancer that keeps you in bed? What's the sense of having voting rights if your intestines are infected with worms and diseases that should have been eradicated in a nation that's wealthy? Fundamentals of the very American ideal of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is environmental justice. And so I feel people say your piece of legislation is we really have to watch our personal, personal pronouns in this town. <laughs> My team in the back there spent months and months of working with grassroots environmental groups from coast to coast, listening to them and saying that if we put together an environmental justice bill, what do you want in it? And that's what we put. First of all, guys like Mustafa, who really needs a haircut, y'all. <laughs> Yeah, man. Making guys like us feel so inadequate. <laughs> guys like Mustafa, who works in administration, helped craft executive orders that made it make federal agencies do more than they were doing before. Not enough of Mustafa would like, but more than they were doing before to address these issues. We need to make sure that that's codified into law. So that when you get the Scott Pruitt, and the Donald Trumps of the world, they can't just, with a stroke of a pen, erode a decade's worth of progress. That's in the legislation. How you cannot take the cumulative effect when you're permitting clean air, clean water, instead of just isolating the, the impact of this one thing that's applying to the permit, you have to take the cumulative effect. And when you add yet another thing to newer. Yet another thing is the policy. Yet another thing is the Dublin County. You have to take the cumulative effect. That's common sense. It's not a radical bill. That's in this bill. And then what we're seeing, this trend in America that is so frightening to me, and you see it on everything like campaign finance law, where suddenly corporations are people. Can you see it in environmental law, where, where corporation after corporation is indemnified and protected from lawsuits? Well, we're giving the power in this bill back to the people to allow them, like my father, trying to move into a town, have the right to sue. And we're giving that, that back to communities so that they have the right to take legal action against these corporate villains who are stealing from them, taking away from them, their families, and future generations. I want to end with just this, this feeling that I get sometimes. I have to say I'm guilty as everybody is. But sometimes the problem seems so big, and I feel like I'm banging my head against the wall. And sometimes, especially with an administration like this, you wonder why, how are we going to bring justice? It, it seems so dark and seems so bleak. I just want to end to finishing the story I told you in the beginning. When I became a senator, uh, uh, my, my, my father died six days before I was elected, and, and I came to the Senate. I, uh, my mom was smart. She's like, before you become the United States Senate, I'm taking you to meet John Lewis. And uh, it was an amazing meeting to sit down with this, this titan of a human being who was so damn humble. Wouldn't let my mom and I get up and get more grits. He was serving us. And telling me how much it meant to him that I would be elected the fourth elected African-American in the history of our country, the United States Senate, and, and how moved he was. We left there. My mom was on fire. 
I, it's never happened probably in the history of this country where a guy's going to get sworn in as a United States Senator, his mother's lecturing him the whole way. <laughs> Boy, don't you forget where you came from, the struggles, the sacrifice. Don't forget the title doesn't make the man, the man's got to make the title. I get sworn in and, and my career starts. But eventually, about a year into it, I decided to write a book and I decided to go back and try to, you know, make sure every story that I've learned as a child was true or not. I had to figure out when I write the story, was it a dog that my dad fought or was it a pack of wolves? And so I call up to find these people who help my family. I tried to find the head of the Fair Housing Council from the 1960s and she was easy to find because she's still the head of the Fair Housing Council. <laughs> Okay, you want to talk about people? I'm half her age. She's 91 years old. Ms. Lee Porter still fighting for justice. Now she's not representing black families, it's Muslim families, same sex couples. That is what greatness is. Decades and decades fighting, never giving up. You may not solve all the problems, but she was there, still there for families in need. And then I think, well, I want, I need to, I need to find a lawyer. I gotta find a lawyer that was in the room. I need to know pack of wolves or not. And and she said to me, I'm sorry, but Marty Friedman is, is passed away. And it's just it's, I felt shame. Like how how many of us in this room right tonight you go on Facebook and send a text say thank you to somebody that deserves a thank you from I don't care if it's a fifth grade teacher or a, a lacrosse coach, whatever. We just don't say thank you to each other enough. And I felt shame that I didn't. And she saw the shame, she said, Look. There's a lawyer that organized all these other lawyers. You should meet that person, and 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 you can thank him and find out the facts of the matter. And I said, okay. And I called him up, and Arthur left. And it's good that I called him because he was being died in about a year or so, 84 years old. And and the end of the story really is this: I asked him why he did what he did. Why would this white guy who is just starting out in his career, a just put a shingle out, why would he? When he didn't have any money, why would he help all of these black families trying to integrate a, 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 an affluent community, his community? And he said to me, well, I remember the day that I made the decision. I go, okay, March, whatever, what's the date? He goes, no, I'm right. I said, the day, I remember it was a Monday. And I said, it was a Monday? How do you know it was Monday? He goes, because that Sunday I was sitting on my couch, comfortable, watching a movie, and they cut in. And suddenly they showed the news of a whole bunch of people on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, people trying to march from Selma through Lowndes County, from Selma to Montgomery. And I watched with horror as they're being beaten with billy clubs and tear gas. It was an awful, horrific scene. And I came to work that next day, that Monday, and I told my partner, we got to go to Alabama. He laughed, not because the situation was funny, but just because of what was funny is we couldn't even afford a plane ticket, not to mention we closed our business. And we sat back and we decided, okay, we can't solve the problems of, of, of segregation in the South, but maybe we can do the best we can with what we have, where we are. And they got on the phone and started calling around to see who needed lawyers to help with anything to do with civil rights. And they found Miss Lee Porter of the Fair Housing Council. They were handed the case file. A few years later, the case file they were handed, that, that Mr. Arthur Lessman was handed with my parents, Case file, Harry Carolyn Booker. And I tell you that right now to tell you that this is a massive problem. What I have seen haunts me what I've seen in this country. But what I want everyone here to leave with is maybe not just the technical specifics from really some great experts, but I want you to leave here to understand that you yourself, what you choose to do today, tomorrow, over the coming week, can make a difference. If one person, if I think of this, if one of those marchers know that just by standing up and even failing to reach their destination, just standing up in resistance to segregation, that they instantaneously, their love, their righteousness, instantaneously from that one act would change leaps literally a thousand miles and change the heart of someone in New Jersey who would go, then go on and change the outcome for families, change the outcome for generations yet unborn. That is the power of righteous action. It leaves space and time and has impact far beyond it. You know, just standing up and saying something. The opposite of justice is not injustice. It is silence. It is indifference. It is inaction. We must stand up in this country. 
and wake up the moral imagination of our neighbors. Wake up the consciousness of this country and let them know what is going on because we are violating our principles and our ideals, but nothing will change unless we do. And if we do change, if we double down, if we work harder, I know in my heart that we will hand off to the next generation, next generation, a nation that is far closer to its ideal of liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Outstanding. This is a special night. This is truly a special night. Uh, Senator, I want to say it's an honor for you to take the time on your busy schedule to come here to us and be with us this evening. We appreciate your leadership, your de de dedication, and your determination. And I think it inspires all of us to, to do better, to be better. You know, there's a saying, you, you don't know what you don't know. But there comes a time when the lenses are clear. And there comes a time you have an opportunity to learn because someone took the time to tell you. So we have to take advantage of those moments, learn, because learning is power. It is a self-empowerment to go forward. And so we appreciate your efforts this evening. Now, with that being said, what I would like to do is let uh, Patrice, let you go ahead and kind of comment on what the senator said, and then we'll go over to Mustafa, and then we'll have a series of questions. Great. Well, I, I want to do a couple of things. One, I want to say thank you so much for what you're giving to this, to this movement and what you're giving to those of us who are, who are working uh, uh, in concert with you to, to, to grapple with issues of environmental justice. Um, I want to compliment the, the, uh, your approach to this effort, um, and I want to do it by, by drawing out uh, uh, something of a comparison. You, as you decided, as a relatively uh, small part of your job, important part of your job, but this bill is just a small piece of a vast set of responsibilities you have uh, as uh, a member of the U.S. Senate. And you took that role so seriously that you went out, you went across the country, you visited the community, you you saw how people were living and how people were experiencing firsthand just so that you could come back, take those voices, take that input, and create a proposal that would grapple with the issues that are really challenging people's lives and livelihoods. I want to contrast this with almost every administrator of the EPA we have ever had. Not one of them. Not one of them, perhaps with the exception of Lisa Jackson, who I had the great pleasure of knowing, and Mustafa had the great pleasure of knowing and working with, not one of them has ever done what you did. And their job every day from 9 to 7, right, all day long, is to deal with environmental issues. There's something broken about the way we approach environmental law, environmental protection. If that tour, that deep understanding of the people who are affected by those activities that allow us the privilege to live the way we do, if those people who, whose job it is to do that aren't out there hearing the stories, seeing firsthand, understanding why it matters what they do, right? And the fact that you did that in connection with this bill tremendous. Uh, and that's how we all have to approach the work that we do, recognizing that we're not doing it for us. We're not doing it for the people who show up to lobby us to make decisions. Right? We're doing it for the people who are, in fact, affected by those decisions. And I think uh, it goes to one of the central tenets of environmental justice, right? that, that the decisions you make have to be informed by the voices and the concerns of the people who are affected by the issue. Uh, and you live that in a way that I wish others would do as well. Thank you, Brent. You could get a haircut too. Man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> My wife tells me that pretty well. <laughs> uh, 
really want to give me the microphone now? Yeah. <laughs> uh, authenticity it is what you have to have if you're going to work on environmental justice issues in, in an effective way. I think about three different words. One of them is privilege. Um, so folks know I do this thing called real talk. Um, and if you're doing it right, I'm going to highlight that. And if you're not quite doing it right, I'm going to highlight that too. And, and, and I was blessed to go with um, Senator Booker, as you said. And I watched him, and it's important because it connects to the legislation, to put his privilege to the side. So you see, if you call yourself on work with our community, they're going to know if you're real or not. Um, and some will give you a little space. Um, but many will check you very quickly because there have been a lot of promises that have been made and have been broken. Um, so I watched him move his privilege to the side, uh, and that brought me closer to him because I, I watch folks. And, and in the environmental justice world, all you have is your bond, all you have is your word. And if you break that with folks, then you can pretty much just wrap it up and move on down the road because folks are not going to deal with you anymore because they, they've been through that too many times. So privilege is one part. The other part, as Patrice said, is about listening. We have way too many folks who want to create policy based upon the beltway and what's going on there instead of what's happening outside in the real world, what's needed. Um, so listening to folks has been extremely important also. And I know um, that there are lots of folks who always would like for there to be more opportunity for that to happen, and I know that it will be an ongoing process. But that's the other one. The other thing is power. And many folks have a difficult time uh, in understanding the power dynamics that go on inside of our most vulnerable communities. Uh, and they sometimes don't understand the power dynamics that people have to deal with. And I watched you also understand how important it was for us to make sure that people are reclaiming their own power, uh, utilizing that power to make sure that, that real change happens. Power is a word that in our country seems to be restricted to just a small amount of folks. And, and I know that you, and, and it's reflected in the bill, that that is, is not what, you know, what, where your focus has been. Y'all do me a favor. Everybody say power. power. See, half y'all didn't even believe that you have any power. Try it again. Say power. Oh. Say it one last time. Power. power. So you see this Environmental Justice 2017 Act is about helping folks to reclaim their power. It's about codifying the work that has already happened in many instances and bringing in new elements that folks have been asking for. And that is extremely important. Um, as Senator Booker said, not just because if we have a person um, you know, leading in the White House who, who doesn't believe in, in our issues or, or doesn't see value in the lives inside of our community, but it's about helping folks to understand that no matter who is in those spaces and places, that we can still make change. One of the things I like, and I just talked to this reporter earlier. Um, it's always fun talking to reporters, you know. And uh, he asked me the question. He said, well, does it really matter, this act? And I said, well, yes, it does. One, it helps to put down a benchmark for folks, to let them know um, about what has gone on and what still needs to happen. Um, and, and that we are recognizing it and highlighting it for the country. And the more and more often that we are able to share these environmental justice opportunities to make real change, it helps to in, sort of infuse it into the culture of the country. When you, and I've seen you work with, you know, a number of young people, when it comes to climate and environmental justice, you don't have to convince people at 30 or 35 that it's real and that it needs to be addressed. Um, and it helps to reinforce for them. Um, but for some of those folks who've been around a little bit longer, I'm not going to call nobody out, um, then, you know, there, there's some work that needs to happen in that space. The other thing that it does is that it sends a message to the state that here is a set of um, activities, a set of processes that you can take for yourself and look at what's happening in your state and then begin to place some of those in and add new concepts in, new areas, um, and, and I think that that's really important also. And it also says something to those folks who've been doing the work, that you're not alone, that there are folks who are on the Hill uh, who are authentic, who are listening, uh, and who understand that this is one foundational piece and that there are other pieces that are going to be needed, 
um, and that we have to engage together to build those coalitions that are going to be necessary. The other thing that I think it also does is that it complements. And it's amazing as I travel around the country, not enough folks know about the Climate Justice and Environmental Justice Caucus, Task Force, however you want to label it, that's there also now as an intersection point, as a place where folks can go um, and share about what their expectations are, um, and then to hold people accountable. And I see those two things as, as you know, um, companions, if you will, um, from the Senate to the House. Um, the other things that are, that are really important, I think, is, is that, you know, when you talked about, you know, housing justice and transportation justice and, and economic justice, health justice, in the environmental justice world, all of those things fall under environmental justice for us. We take a holistic approach to what needs to happen uh, inside of our communities. And, you know, the EJ uh, 2017 Act, I think, moves us in a direction that it helps to make sure that those things will still exist um, and, uh, and it helps to hold people accountable. Uh, I don't think that the new administration and their wildest expectations or wildest dreams even, that they thought this much attention would happen to environmental justice. And because of that intention, uh, of the intention that it's received, it has made it much more difficult for them to eliminate and roll back things that were a part of the original plan. Um, so I'm thankful that, that we're moving in, in this direction. And, and I know many of the folks who have been working on these issues are also. You know, we also know there's a lot more work that needs to happen. Um, and, and I know folks are looking forward to engaging with you and many of the other members who are now getting much more anchored uh, in, into what's going on in communities, but also the opportunities that are out there also and, and highlighting those as well. Spartanburg, South Carolina, the Ivanhoe neighborhood uh, in Kansas City, the environmental uh, work that Diane Tagorian, Tagorian is doing in San Diego and National City and so many others, uh, the Moving Forward Network. Um, so all those things come together inside of this act. Let me ask a question. And you touched upon this, Senator, but what obstacles are hindering the progress of environmental justice? And it may be White House, it may be Congress, but it might be items that we're not aware of. So what, what are some of the issues that you see? So you've got to go first. <laughs> well, so I have an observation, and I think it, it, it also reflects a part of what you're attempting to do in this bill. Um, and, 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 and I'll even connect it back to the story you were telling about your parents trying to, trying to uh, get housing in, in New Jersey when you, were, when you were a child, before you were born. The, um, in my experience, uh, as a policymaker at EPA for many years, uh, and the Department of Justice and the Environment and Natural Resources Division has been agencies, certainly agencies like EPA, that grapple with these sorts of big environmental policy questions. They deal with those issues that the law forces them to deal with. That's what gets done. Um, they don't have the time. They don't have the inclination to go out and find more things to think about, more things to do, more things to work on. And so one of the things that stands as an obstacle isn't even an obstacle. It isn't an obstacle about votes. It isn't an obstacle about uh, 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 an obstinate leader in the executive branch. It's an obstacle about the fact that institutional inertia stands against doing things that aren't required. And the wisdom of taking, calling out the need for something like this is the recognition that if an obligation to do something is not called out in the law, the chances are, guess what? It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. And even when it's called out in the law, it ain't going to happen unless what? Unless there are resources, but also unless there is legal accountability for doing it. You don't have to look any farther than the hazardous air pollutant program under the Clean Air Act. Guess when EPA issues rules under the hazardous air pollutant program, which of course regulates those sources of pollutants that are most likely to be located in poor communities, most likely to be located in communities of color. When does EPA regulate? under the Hazardous Air Pollutant Program under the Clean Air Act when somebody sues them for failing to meet their statutory deadline. That's when those rules, that's when those rules get promulgated. 
right? And so part of the problem, part of the obstacle, isn't that you can't get the votes in Congress, that, that, that's an obstacle too, or that the White House won't do, won't represent everyone in the country. If the institutional inertia, inertia prevents these kinds of things from happening, and if the law says you have to do it, and the law provides a mechanism for holding the agencies who are responsible accountable for actually doing it. Um, and that's why an executive order doesn't get you there. And so, go ahead. So one of the obstacles that I've always seen, and um, it, it amazes me, is that we have members who are being paid by people's tax dollars but never spend any time inside of their community. We have leadership um, at agencies and departments uh, who don't spend any time inside of these communities. Um, so then it's so much easier for you to create or implement policy that is disconnected from what folks are looking for and the realities of their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and that's why it's so important because if you go uh, to Mrs. Ramirez's community and you sit down in her kitchen and have a conversation with her, and then you go back to Washington or to the State House and continue to implement policy that's not beneficial to her, then we know what's up with your humanity and your morality. And the exact same thing if you have a conversation with Mr. Johnson on his back porch, and then you go back and you do some similar things. So I think one of the things that will slightly begin to change this culture that, that has to shift is for people to actually spend time in communities. I'll ask folks in this room, how many of you have spent significant time in communities with environmental injustices? You don't have to, I mean, just raise your hand. So you see there's probably about a tenth of the room and this room is filled with people who care. Imagine for those folks who still have to be convinced or shown or educated, um, you know, how even fewer of those individuals had the opportunity that Senator Booker had. He didn't have to go. He didn't have to go outside of New Jersey. He didn't have to go to North Carolina or Alabama or Louisiana or any of the places. But imagine if we had folks who actually just went and spent time and talked with folks. And then folks on both sides of the aisle were able to sit down and say, well, these four things I think I can agree on and those three things over there you can agree on. And we begin to incrementally make the changes that are necessary. So I see that as one of the things up on the hill. So that we'll give you a chance to close. Yes, and I just, oh, I, I, mean, I apologize. Um, I, I, I went to another event about uh, sex education, actually, about, <laughs> which is, which I'm leave it alone. You can leave it alone. alone. <laughs> <laughs> about science-based sex education, abstinence-only policy. I have a bill on that as well. Yes, so you should not have abstinence only. We should deal with that. Um, and, and this guy right here who's standing there, think Adam Zipkin, um, him and Ariana, who is in the back, those are the two people that actually uh, crafted a lot, of the, a lot of the bill. I want to thank them. <laughs> um, I was impatient. Uh, Adam would would, uh, would lecture me rightfully about we need to wait until we get more consensus from the communities. Because those communities are working with us. Adam is also uh, a fellow vegan, except for he looks like a vegan. I don't <laughs> really think what vegans look like. Uh, um, um, but uh, I I do want to say something that we remind ourselves of in this office. Um, that all our my office all the time is that change doesn't come from Washington. It comes to Washington, uh, and it's really, I, I think about every major advancement. Um, you know, you didn't have Strom Thurmond sitting around thinking, well, let me, let me see, maybe I will give black people the right to vote. No, it was whites and blacks and Latinos and others all joining together and, and pushing, kind of forcing Washington to act. That's why I love what Patrice said about this idea of the law forcing people um, to do that. You're not going to get corporations who can sell so from a perverse, broken system for generations suddenly to decide that this is something altruistically they want to do, which even though I would argue that you can be more successful by doing the right thing. And and Mustafa, he, he's, he's really a righteous brother as much as I like, I, I take great pleasure in using him, but he really is a righteous brother. And I think when he made everybody say the word power, um, that's really when I end. Alice Walker says most commonly people who have their power is not realizing they have it in the first place. And that's what really we people have to recognize is that everybody here has not only power but also the responsibility to do something about this. Um, I, I always think it's a chain reaction that's necessary. It's not always happens this way, 
But first, people have to know there's got to be knowledge because that creates empathy. Then from empathy, it creates action, and then from action, it creates change or justice. And so a lot of people don't even know, aren't even aware about these things. And I confess, I sincerely confess, I did not know uh, until until I became a center and, and as Mustafa said, sort of traveling all, all, all around. And so it just behooves all of us to be a part of that, either getting people to be woke about these issues, getting people, triggering people's empathy, uh, uh, calling on people to act. We've all got to be activists in some area of that chain. Um, I just have this confidence uh, about this idea of hope. I have such un unflagging hope that we will be a nation that, that sheds ourselves from this uh, vile evil. But hope for me is not a being verb. Uh, hope is a, a, a word that has its sleeves rolled up and it's working. Uh, and, and that's what hope is. And I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for the folks that are here, but there's a lot more work to do. And you all inspire me and fire me up. Uh, and I want to thank you, and I also want you to say, to ask you all, to please be advocates of science-based sex education in our community. Well, we have to say goodbye to the senator, but we still have a lot more time and a lot more to, uh, discussion to go on. So let me do this. Let me open it up to questions from the audience, if I may. Go right ahead. Do we have a mic? Hold on one second. And your mic. So, um, the Environmental Justice Act really highlights the importance and uh, that we need to support the nation um, for different levels of um, boundaries and like, inflation along with the level of things we need to support. So with this in mind, how should different branded book sales be achieved goals? And um, how can environmental justice grow from the margins to the mainstream? And um, how can um, different stakeholders, federal, state, community, contribute to these efforts? And also, um, where do you see um, historic opportunities for this exploration? And if I can repeat for the webinar, Basically, it's a question of coordination, the environmental justice calls for coordination at the state, federal, grassroots levels. How do you do that? What's the best way to do that? And, and what are some of the issues that you see? Right. Right. Do you want to go ahead? Uh, so the coordination, there are already tools that are in place if folks to just utilize them properly. Uh, so we mentioned Executive Order 12898 um, and the Interagency Working Group. Uh, so there is an opportunity there for the new administration to make sure that they're senior level officials. Those folks who have responsibility for how policy is going to move forward and the budget um, to make sure that they're getting together on a periodic basis. In the previous administration, uh, we were blessed to have that happen, um, to have chiefs of staff and others getting together to make sure that we were moving forward uh, in a holistic fashion. There are strategies. Uh, that each of the federal agencies have um, to make sure those are implemented. Folks could also look at um, uh, EJ 2020 that exists inside the Environmental Protection Agency and the other uh, departments and agencies that are a part of the federal family around EJ could make sure that they have something similar based upon whatever their respective needs are and priorities. Um, that's one way. And then they could make sure that they're working with ECOS um, as well, the Environmental um, uh, ECOS, uh, Environmental Council of State. Um, is another opportunity for there to be that synergy um, and collaboration happening uh, in that space. Um, so that's one part. And to be quite honest, I can't remember the other three questions that you asked. <laughs> what was the other part? Well, I think you basically, okay. What's the best thing? Yeah, I, I don't have a lot to add to that. I guess I would say, um, you know, what, one of the critical elements of doing it well gets back to, you know, this essential principle that environmental justice is an inherently local issue. Environmental justice, um, so in, in, in many ways, how do we coordinate uh, is going to look really different from community to community, from state to state, from region to region, and how you figure out what that's going to look like is going to, de is going to rely on authentically including affected communities in the process of deciding how you do that. Uh, and and um, there are many mechanisms to help inform
policymakers about how to approach that from the state level to the federal level. Um, but, but again, I, I think ultimately there's not a there's no one size fits all approach. It, it will look very different as you go from from place to place. One thing I was going to add is collaboration takes transparency, and no organization, no movement goes forward without people feeling confident in the cost now. The more that you're transparent, the more that the community is involved in the decisions that you make, the more buy-in you have, the more confident and confident you have at the tail end of the decision. And that's just human nature. Let me do this. Let's open up to another question. Was there another question? Okay. I may repeat for the people on the internet, questions dealing with the mechanisms that can be used to include voices in the discussion, and then the wish, wishes for the panel to talk about bipartisanship and the challenges, the inherent challenges that they face. So Patrice, let you start off. Yeah, uh, so this question of mechanisms to include voices, and certainly if what we're talking about is um, policy making and decision making of Federal agencies, and of course, that's what that's what the uh, uh, Senator Booker's bill targets. Um, the, the the mechanisms aren't aren't really the, the the trouble, right? I mean, the mechanisms are fairly straightforward. Our agencies know how to convene hearings. We know how to how to agencies know how to bring people together and ask for advice and 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 get input. Um, I think, as Mustafa is pointing out, it would be um, it would be great to see those folks who are involved in decision making actually out in the community and and having some of those conversations where it matters. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in many ways, the question isn't the difficulty, at least as I perceive it, is not so much about um, how do you hear the voices, it's how do you ensure that you're actually listening to them. How do you how do you ensure that you're giving them equal weight to all the other voices that you're hearing, most of which have are backed by much more money and much more influence? And this ultimately requires adopting a decision making process that looks in some ways very different, that allows for those voices to carry weight um, and allows for consideration of uh, 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 some of these issues of uh, the importance of a, and compassion in the agency decision-making process driving some of the outcome. Uh, and that's something that looks very different from what agencies do right now. And that making that transition to a different paradigm for decision-making is, is, is where ultimately I think the challenges lie for agencies. Um, I'll stop there, and I think there, there was a second part to that, but we can come back to it. Sure. So it, it, the reason that I talk about power so much is that it, it plays out in the question that was just asked. So if you want to truly make sure that you're getting real engagement from folks, allow them to play a role in the development of the agenda, of the question, uh, of the prioritization, all those various things. So we learned those lessons coming up in the environmental justice work um, to make sure that, you know, it was 
the folks from communities who were leading the design of the agenda, who were developing the meeting, who were actually developing what the room looked like to make sure that it was inclusive and folks felt that everybody had an equal voice in the process. Um, and that's an interesting dynamic that some folks still have a problem with. They have a problem with it that when you make sure that people have an equal voice in the process, you might not get what you thought was mm -hmm. going to come out of the process. Um, so those are some of the lessons that we learned. The National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, which has really fundamentally, if you pay attention, changed the way the Environmental Protection Agency has done business. They created a model plan for public participation uh, and then updated it. So it actually, if you say, well, I have no idea how to engage with them, their folks, well, yeah, here you go. Here, here's some ideas on how to be able to do it um, and, and what are some of the steps. And they come from stakeholders sharing what they're looking for and the best ways of engaging with them. So Patrice shared that there are tools out there. Those are just some of the tools that exist. Also, building public comment uh, into uh, meetings that happen so that you actually are hearing from folks and it's not sanitized or watered down so that you know what you need to be able to do to be able to move forward. Or just another example uh, that's out there that we need to feel safe enough to be able to do. I can't tell you how many meetings I sat in with folks to say, oh, we want to engage with environmental justice communities, but what they were really saying is, but we just don't feel safe in having conversations with these folks. We don't feel safe in going to certain places. Well, if you don't feel safe going there uh, for a meeting, how do you think folks feel who have to live there all the time? So there are opportunities that exist for us uh, to make sure that we're engaging properly. So I'll turn it back over to Patrice for the second part. Yeah. So you, you raised another question about this bipartisanship, which I think is an important one. Um, and, and I think Senator Booker touched on, on this issue a little bit at least, right? You, you, you have to set aside for a second um, this question of the moral character of the people you're talking to. Now, let's assume you're talking to people of moral character. Um, the issues that we're dealing with are not issues that should be offensive to anyone, right? This is people's right to, to have integrity of their body, people's right to not be subject to constant assault from their environment, people's right to live in a place that allows them to live up to their full potential without dis carrying disproportionate burdens for the benefit of the, of the rest of society, right? No one should have a problem with that, right? And so when you can present the issue and present it as this question of do we all deserve the right to begin our journey with the opportunity to reach our full potential, unburdened by assault and, and injustice, um, the answer has to be, Yes, and then the question is, how do we get there, right? Then the question is, how do we get there? If the answer is no, when you present it that way, then you're back to the question of moral character, and then you, you might as well stop the conversation because you're not going to get anywhere. I think there are two ways that bipartisanship um, has happened and is definitely going to happen more. So we have a changing demographic in our country. We have a changing demographic in the young people who are coming up uh, who are demanding that these issues be addressed. And then we have a changing demographic in black and brown people, or, or some people say the browning of the nation, if you will. Um, so you're going to have to address these issues. So that's one part of it, because politicians want to make sure that they get reelected. So if they want to get reelected, that means that they're going to have to meet the needs of where the wave of energy is moving. Um, the other side of that, if you want to know how you can get folks on both sides of the aisle, to, to start to come together around some of our issues. And it's only, it's not in every case, but it's in revitalizing our community. But we have to make sure there's a just transition in that plan because as we begin to revitalize our communities, often people get displaced if we don't make sure that there's a just transition and there are other things that are put in place to make sure that the folks who are living there when the negative things were happening and now it's all cleaned up and pretty and shiny, that they don't get pushed out. Um, so if you look at where bipartisanship has happened. Look at Spartanburg, South Carolina, where they took that $20,000 environmental debt for small grant leverage into $300 million in changes. There were folks on both sides of the aisle who got involved in that process. There were foundations. There were, of course, the grassroots, or there was 
you know, Harold Mitchell, who's executive director of the Genesis Project, and a number of other folks. So if you go to South Carolina, you had folks who are on both sides of the aisle who are part of that process. If you look at some of the other successful projects, you'll find that there eventually was bipartisanship because people want to get around success. So as you're able to get some wins, then people are much more likely to come into that space uh, and then to continue to move forward. So I share that as another way uh, that we get to the bipartisanship because when we start to talk about economic opportunities and worker training programs, some of the other things, people can get around some of that where they have more difficulty sometimes uh, and some of the other things that we have challenging happening inside of our community. And the other thing too is when we begin to revitalize our community, you know, we have housing and transportation, we have healthcare, we have so many different aspects that come in that holistic process that folks can see an intersection point um, when if you only have one issue, it makes it much tougher for them to get involved. So I share that for some of the situations that are going on, not all of them. It gets to this, this underlying observation and this point that healthy, vibrant, and productive communities are good for our country. Yeah, yeah. And I'll put Can a you, I'm sorry. No, no, okay. Yeah, and I'll just put a plug in that, that we are creating a revitalizing vulnerable communities institute in Spartanburg, South Carolina. So for those folks who are interested in learning how, you know, communities are properly revitalized. That's one place that you can go. There are other examples on the green zones also uh, across the country of how folks are being able to revitalize their communities as well, everywhere from California, all across the country. With the fire truck going by, let me ask, is there another question from the audience? I think so. Oh, yeah, we better use the mic now. <laughs> Um, not to be done, but I am. Um, I just want to ask you. Um, you spoke a lot about the village is doing something and about the environmental justice framework, which is doing something. Can you talk to the folks in this room? Can everybody in here is a viewer? What do we have to help do to get in? Because this village is not good. Even if everything goes wrong, well, sorry, this village is not fix it. So, what else has to be undone? What do people in this room do about that? For those on the internet, the question is, what do we have to undo to move forward? I keep asking if they want me to keep talking. Uh, so what do we need to do? I mean, you have some great examples just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Folks in Virginia engaged in the civic process and made sure that their voices were heard uh, and that if you are not meeting our expectations, we'll find somebody else who will. Uh, and you saw that across the country. So getting engaged in the civic process. Uh, there's the clean power plant hearing that's happening today in Charleston, West Virginia. So folks are going there um, and providing comment. Um, and, and also there are those who will adjudicate <laughs> the legal process uh, that, that's to come, not only around that, but a number of other things that folks have been trying to roll back. Um, so that's another part of the process. The other thing is just getting engaged. You had the Women's March at the beginning of the year. No one thought a million women were going to come together, but not only did they come together, but they went back home and they got engaged and they said some of us are going to run for office, other people are going to be supportive, but we're going to make sure that people are held accountable. We had a science march. We had scientists come out their labs. How many of y'all thought scientists were actually going to come out their labs? <laughs> some of them didn't have no rhythm, but, you know, they marched. That's power because it's getting folks engaged in a process. And not only did they go and march, but then they are starting to work with our most vulnerable communities and helping them to understand some of the more technical information. So for me, that's an optimistic sign of what is happening. We have the People Climate March, all kinds of different folks coming together. We have Black Lives Matter. We have all these different things where people are saying that these are not our values. This is not a reflection of what our country is supposed to be about, so they're getting engaged. So we have people getting engaged on that side. We have people getting engaged on the legal side of defending those hard-fought wins that have happened um, and, and holding people accountable and making sure that this is not going to be an easy win uh, for those who would like to roll us back and, and, and take us back to the future, as I often say. Yeah, and, and so I'll add just a, a piece to that, expanding a bit on, on the legal advocacy. As someone who works for uh, a litigating organization, there are a lot of fights to be had. Um, and I think you, you think back to the story that Senator Booker was telling about um, the group of lawyers in New Jersey who, who watched the, uh, the, 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 the 
the, the march in, in Selma and said, well, what can we do, right? And then got together and said, well, we're going to jump in and help where we can help. Well, there is plenty of this work to be done, whether it's in, in – and I know we're talking here to a room full of mostly lawyers. Um, there's a lot of legal work to be done. Uh, and uh, certainly for my organization, we are regularly litigating cases on behalf of communities and tribes, and we are not nearly doing all the work that needs to be done because we can't. Um, but, but both the figuring out how to do that work, how to contribute to that work, where the law can step in and make the difference, um, and supporting the organizations that are doing that for us. Do we have any more questions from the audience? We actually have our own question. I'm going to go to the governor, Debra Butler. The Alabama Golf Coast Recovery Council is created by the Restore Act Point Golf, but not the city's name is a car impacted by environmental injustices prior to during the other result of the deep water drive on our own side. Can you use color for this council to ignore the public meeting? What can be done with this current and funding in this council? Yeah, good question. <laughs> <Are you aggressive>? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think that, you know, that's not uncommon, and I've seen it over the years, you know, where when the spotlight is there, everybody's talking about kumbaya and doing all the right things, um, and then as soon as the attention leaves, uh, people revert back to old behaviors. Um, and so that's why we have to keep the spotlight on. That's why attorneys have to continue to get engaged in those processes and hold people accountable. But even before we get to that, making sure that we are properly making sure that the construction uh, of what a process is going to look like is going to have those stop gaps or going to have those accountability aspects built into them so that five years, ten years down the road, um, when uh, the work is really starting to, to, to come together, that people are not forgotten or being sort of push to the side. Um, so we, we've got to make sure of that. And the reason we got to make sure of that is because as, as the person who was just online raised this for us, we've got the situation right now in Puerto Rico where we know the lessons that have been learned from Katrina uh, and from the BP oil spill and a number of other both man-made and natural disasters that these actions, once the cameras leave, we're going to have to make sure that the right things are in place. So one of the things we can do is help to continue to, to put the, uh, the spotlight on, uh, on the folks who you just uh, shared with us, uh, and then to look for those legal remedies and, and be there for folks to, to help them to, to be able to navigate these processes. Patrice, we may have one minute. One minute. Okay, so really quickly, I, so a couple of things. I think this, this issue illustrates what's at the heart of the, this problem of institutional inertia. Things do not happen unless there is an obligation to do them. Communities are not included. Things don't work differently. Things don't function in new ways unless there is some impetus driving those changes. Um, and that's the importance of really adjusting a broken paradigm and making sure that we approach this sort of work from a very different perspective. And the way that happens is if it's compelled. If it's compelled uh, and if there are accountability, accountability mechanisms to ensure that that's the way uh, it works. Um, in, in, in the meantime, we have to continue making sure that people have the opportunity to tell their story. Because story is what drives action. Right. Yeah. Let's give our panel a round of applause. If I may do some quick closing remarks and our thank yous at the end. But I heard some important things tonight. Like I said, what you learn. And as you learn, you're empowered. I know I feel much more empowered now than I did an hour ago from just being here with our panelists and with the esteemed senator. We, we heard about inertia, we heard about inclusion, we heard about transparency, and one thing that wasn't said, but we were living it, we heard about conclusions. All those are, are factors that we have to focus on to move the ball forward. And as we go forward, we have to keep our eyes open. We have to acknowledge problems, okay, much of what the senator talked about, the problems that you don't even know exist. 
Now, when you acknowledge a problem, often we're unaware that there even is a problem. And I'm not the only one in the room who's sometimes unaware. When I was a teenager in St. Louis, I, was, I didn't think nothing of it when they had a liquor store on every other corner. I didn't think anything about when they had signs for cigarette promotion next to a school. I was unaware. And so we also don't, didn't think very much about a manufacturing site being next to someone's home or that there's too much smoke coming from, a, from some type of smelting facility that they, kids can go out and play and they know it. They know to come back in the house at a certain hour. We were unaware. But ladies and gentlemen, when you have the opportunity to hear the senator speak in Paris like, that we had today or this evening, you're not unaware anymore. And so you have to find ways to sensitize yourself and to incorporate it. I'm a corporate attorney. But at the same time, though, I can save my clients money if I am able to position them in a way to get to an understanding that is neutral. That's where you want to go. And at the end of the day, that's where you're going to be. Whether you spend a lot of legal fees up front or you, or you work at the beginning to have a collaborative activity. So everyone has to come to the table with their ears open. And as you go through this, keeping your eyes open, acknowledge, look for solutions, collaborate, you do it all again because success is an imperative process. So with that, I want to say thank you to our sponsors, ELI, ABA, CRSG, Environmental Justice Committee, ABA, SEER, Special Committee on Environmental Justice, Criminal Justice Section, Public Section Division, and my firm, Beverage Environment. Now we're going to have a reception right after this down the hallway, and I invite everyone to come down and let's talk a little bit more. Let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? I'm sorry. I'm sure.